Well, I don't know what happened there, folks. My deepest apologies. I have no idea what just happened, so we'll just start again and see if we can tie these two together. I don't know how to do that, but I don't know what happened. I see uh, Tammy Frost checking in. Good to see you, Tammy. So for you guys that are still watching, I'm just going to pick up where I left off. I don't know what happened. Phone just went blank. No idea what happened. So, and I have a fast internet connection, so I'm going to point my fingers at Facebook on this one. I have no idea what happened. So anyway, now we got the um, we got our food chain together, and the way you want to do that is you want to be sure it's diverse. You, it, up north, up north, it may be um, pumpkin seeds with scuds, with white suckers and fathead minnows. Up north, that might be what it is. In Texas, it'll be bluegill, red ear sunfish, threadfin shad. Jump start when you first stock with fathead minnows. So when you've got the diversity of the food chain that you need for your fishery, and then the next thing is the very, very best genetics. So, I mean, Kyle McKean, he's a cattle man as well with all the other things he does. Kyle will be the first one to tell you, if you don't have good have a good bull in the herd and you don't change that bull over every few years, you know, you're not gonna have the best genetics for your cattle. So, uh, Genetics is a big deal. If you want to grow big largemouth bass, you got to have Florida strain genetics. If you want to grow giant bluegills, you need to use local genetics. Now in Texas, we can get away with using copper nose bluegills. So uh, Kyle, how big of a pond is needed for thread fin? You know what, really, really Kyle, for a thread fin shad pond to try to grow big fish, I'd say three acres is probably the, the, the smallest size. Three acres or bigger is about what you need be able to grow thread fins and what you need to start growing a few big fish as well. Now, if you want to grow big catfish, they're easy. You can feed those. Channel catfish are easy. You can you can feed those things all day long and they're going to do great. Uh, but they can get really big really fast. But having the right kind of food chain is what you need to be able to grow some really, really, really big fish. Now here I'm going to, I'm going to have to read my Here's Scott Hoensey checking in. Good to see you, Scott. And I don't know what's going on with this dead gun broadcast. Anyway, um, food chain is a big deal. So diversity is a big deal. Now, genetics is a big deal. Genetics of bluegill, genetics of red ear, genetics of largemouth bass. Hybrid strappers is not so much important because those genetics are always diverse when you get them. You know, uh, smallmouth, buy from a reputable dealer. And you want, if you can get smallmouth on feet, yellow perp, same thing. Be selective. Pick, pick the very best of the best if you want to grow big fish. Then here's the thing. Here's where it really gets to be fun. It's now once you've got good water, you're keeping it that way, and you've got great habitat from the beginning, you got the right genetics, you got the right food chain, all these things are coming together. You, what you're going to see is you're going to see your fish differentiate themselves in your environment. You'll see about 25 to 30 percent of them excel. You'll see another 20, 25 percent of them be well above average. You'll see another 20 percent or so be about average. Then the other 20 percent or so are going to be the runts, the males, in the case of largemouth bass, and they're just not going to grow like you'd want them to grow. So that's where culling comes in. Now keep in mind that your pond is like a garden. You're gonna be able to produce fish, but you're also gonna to have to harvest fish. Now the difference is, is you get, you get to pick what you're gonna harvest. You know, you're not gonna go plant 52 rows of tomatoes in your garden and not harvest tomatoes. You're going to harvest tomatoes. You know, if you don't, nature's gonna do it for you. They're gonna rot on the vine. You know, and that's gonna happen in the pond. If you don't harvest fish, things come to a screeching halt and nature's gonna do it for you and you're not gonna like how nature does it because nature does it either with fish kills or studded growth, <clears throat> which completely disrupts the potential for fish to get much, much, much bigger. So harvest is a big deal and be selective about it. Now, study this, study about harvest because you wanna be picky. You don't wanna take the best of the best, so you've got to have the ability to figure out which fish are the best of the best, which means you're gonna weigh and measure some fish. Another thing you're gonna do is you're gonna continually verify the food chain. You know, be there when your feeder goes off. Feed a good feed. Feed Purina's Aquamax feeds. Feed MVP. 
You know, feed your food chain. Feed your food chain, you bolster your food chain, you grow more game fish. Whether it's hybrid strippers, crappie, blue cat, um, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass. If you're, if you're paying attention to that food chain, but when it does come time, which is typically after the third year, it's going to come time for you to begin to harvest some fish. That's typically what we do is tell you to harvest your young of the year. So whenever those first fish you stock begin to, you see them differentiate themselves, you protect the best ones and the next best ones and then the third best ones. Then you start culling the others and the young of the year that are slightly underweight. So weigh and measure fish. Do that. Just do it. I know you don't want to. I don't care. Just do it. You don't have to weigh and measure every fish you catch. That's not reasonable. But weigh and measure enough to get a good representation of what you have in the water. That way, soon you'll begin to know which fish you want to, to harvest. When you On that third year, when you're catching a three and a half or four pound bass, or even a five pound bass, you're going to start to be able to see yourself which fish have differentiated themselves from the rest. Now, at the same time, you got to be sure that the food chain is continuing to produce enough to not only sustain, but to grow the fish that you want to be growing. And the, typically the food chain begins to subside about year three. So that's when you want to be paying close attention to it. And there, here's how you do that. Set some traps, catch some bait fish, same the bait fish after the spawns. Do that in June, do it again in late August, early September, do it again in October. Check it and see. Pull the seine through there. Look at the little seine in the shallow areas where you can get to the water. You know, seine around some of those aquatic plants. Kick some fish out. Take that little 20-foot seine, 50-foot seine, whatever you buy. Go to Memphis Net and Twine and buy yourself a seine. Buy a 50-foot seine, 8 feet deep, 6 feet deep, you know, with floats on top and a mud line on the bottom, and that's your sampling tool. When you finish it, wash it out, let it dry real good, store it in a bin. You know, and you'll have a real good sampling tool. It'll take two people to pull a 50-foot seine unless you really know what you're doing. Now, if you come to the Institute of Higher Pondology coming up here in October or March, you're going to get a good schooling on how to use a seine. So I'll teach you how to do that. It's really fun. Well, it was until I turned about 60. And it still is. Um, so anyway, if you can look and see the different size classes of the different species of fish you have, that's going to be an indicator as to how well your food chain is providing for your game fish. Danny Mac, whoa, Bob, I'm here. I've been forgetting Wednesday evenings because of golf. Golf? You've been playing golf? Yeah, you know what, Danny Mac? I'm sure you've been playing golf outside of San Antonio, 100 degrees. Uh-huh. Okay, well, what'd you shoot today? 72, I bet. a boy. Joe Reynolds is checking in. So, uh, Harvest is, is, is going to be your best long-term ongoing management strategy to be able to monitor the growth rates of your fish. Now, what's past that, and I'm going to get into a lot of detail about this at the Institute of Higher Pondology coming up, and get details on that. Um, send me an email if you want to see a flyer on it. Let me tell you about that real quick, then I'll get back into the show. In uh, October, I think it's 24, 25, 26, 27 through there, the Thursday, Friday, Saturday of that week at my house, I'm going to have the Institute of Higher Pondology, and I'm going to have two sessions. For 250 bucks, you can come on Thursday with a catered meal. We're going to go from 8 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock here in this office at Palm Boss World Headquarters around the conference table, and we're going to take you through the really detailed things about the basics of pond management where the things I'm telling you about in a one-hour interrupted broadcast tonight, you're going to get uninterrupted here with me where you can grill me with questions and things, plus a curriculum that you'll take home with you. And then if you want to get involved in the really deeper, more in-depth pro side of pond management work, fisheries management stuff, that's going to happen from Thursday at 3 in the afternoon, all day Friday, all day Saturday, Sunday morning. That's fifteen hundred dollars for that now if you want to pay the fifteen hundred bucks i'll include all those sessions for you you know now a lot of the stuff we're going to get into detail about is going to be um the things that are beyond the obvious a bunch of the ambiance a bunch of the nuances uh the troubleshooting let me talk about that for a minute 
You know, just to put yourself in the place of this guy with the Six Acre Lake right there in Iowa, Nebraska, uh, when a crop duster flies over and the last five years of his efforts were completely disrupted because of an improper chemical treatment. Now, how livid is he going to be? Because now he's got five years worth of, of balancing things, aeration, you know, stocked fish, feeding, all those things are now disrupted by 15 minutes worth of carelessness. I was going to say stupid, but it's not. It's carelessness. You know, so now one of the things that you got to do is you got to understand that even though you're doing everything you can to produce the very, very best pond with the best fishery, you're going to have hiccups. Plan for that now. Let's see. Troy Todd says, I have a four-year-old pond that was stocked with golden shiners, bluegill, red ears, sunfish for forage after completion. Most of the GSH green. Uh, golden shiners I catch are eight to ten inches. Shoot, that's huge. Should I restock more shiners to replace my shiners due to the parasite that makes them terrible? Yes, you should. <clears throat> you should start taking out, well, you know what? You don't, you don't tell me what you've got in there for bass, but if you've got some bass in there, the golden shiners, the only function that an eight inch golden shiner is going to serve is to feed a big bass. And why hasn't it gotten eaten yet? So my nature is going to be catch it, cut it up, throw it back in, let something else eat it, replace it with some, some bass sized minnows, which would be 12 pounds per thousand. Do that next spring before they spawn. Do that like in February, or March, depending on where you are. <clears throat> so now how, how do you plan for a catastrophe? Um, you really can't, but what you can do is you can think about what can go wrong and then be preemptive. The things that can go wrong is your water can destabilize. <clears throat> the things that can, can go wrong is you can overfeed your fish. So if, you, if you're to the point where your fish are eating, say in a, in a five acre pond, if they're eating 15 pounds of feed a day, that's the most you should ever feed. Here's a little bit of math that'll help you with that. Fish are going to eat about 3% of their body weight of feed every day. So, and they're going to convert that really good Purina, Aquamax fish food, they're going to convert that like at 1.2 or 1.3 to 1. But they're also going to be eating native and natural food too. So you can almost, if you want to do the math and do it where it works, Every, 50, every pound of feed you feed is going to pretty well produce close to a pound of fish, even though the feed doesn't do it directly. So if you're feeding 15 pounds of feed a day, you're pretty much gaining 15 pounds of fish per day. At some point, you're going to reach a carrying capacity of what that pond can, can, can support based on that volume of food production, whether it's coming out of a sack or coming out of the vegetation around that habitat you designed so well. So uh, that's part of what you need to think about because at some point you're going to be feeding fish to maintain their weight, which means the conversion rates are going to drop some, which means there's going to be more waste, which means that your water is going to have to process that waste. So you're going to need to be thinking about keeping your water healthy over and over and over. So what can go wrong? Well, you can have predators come in. You have poachers. You can have otters. And I'm telling you, I'm getting way, way more feedback about otters now than I ever have. Uh, cormorants in the wintertime. Pelicans can do some damage, especially on threadfin shad. You know, so be paying close attention to your, to your predators. Uh, right here in my office, I got six hatchery ponds. Had a crop of five to six inch bluegills going into the fall last year that I didn't harvest. I went in this spring to get them, gone. Cormorants, six or seven flocks of cormorants would hit, you know, once a week when I wasn't here and nobody was here to spook them off, they eradicated all those big fish. Now all I got left is a bunch of little ones, so now I'm feeding those to get bigger. So nature, here, here's a really good law of nature. Nature abhors a vacuum and it also abhors a bounty. Whenever you push your pond to get it where you want it, once you think you've got it there, now you're going to have to fight to keep it there. 
because nature is going to want to do something to get it right there where nature thinks it should be. All the more reason to have the very best habitat. <clears throat> if you've got a scape cover for fish to be able to hide that you design in the beginning, that's the kind of the ways this ties in. That's how to get your productivity up and help keep it up. If you've got places fish can, <coughs> can hide and can escape and get away, then you're tying all these things together. You know, but as you progress by about year three or four, you need to be thinking about your emergency management strategy. What happens if your aeration system goes down? Do you have a backup? You know, what happens when you do get that flock of cormorants in year three and they fly over and you're not there? What can you do about it? Study about that. You know, <laughs> depending on the lake, I, I, I'll tell you something I've seen that works great. These guys at Lake Vilbig, and oftentimes they're watching this show, they, uh, let's see, Troy's in southern Indiana. Yep, okay, three pound plus bass. You're in hybrid stripers. Yeah, you're in pretty good shape, man. <clears throat> let's see here. I'm going to miss something here. Let's see here. Yeah, Troy, I would I would restock. I would restock those golden shiners. I think for what you're doing, that's valuable because you're, you're more interested in their reproduction than you are their size. Think about that. You're more interested in their reproduction than their size. It's more important. Matt Singley, what's your opinion on gators in a pond or a lake? They say they won't eat fish, just turtles and snakes. No, Matt, that's not true. An alligator will not swim swim by a five-pound bass, and he can catch it and pass it up, saying, you know, Matt wants me to keep that five-pound bass in here. They'll eat it, and then they'll eat the dog. <clears throat> so alligators are predators. So yes, they will. Now, especially... Where alligators get to be a problem in a pond is when you finally get to that bounty. When you finally get that pond pushed up where you want it. You know, in, in a natural environment, Dan Van Sch in a natural in a natural environment, you're a lot less likely to be damaged by predators. But most of us, we don't want a natural environment. We want to push it. We want to push the envelope. We want to get more fish, bigger fish. And if you're going to do that, you got to figure out how to protect them. Alligators will come in and eat fish. You know, so wherever you live, you're going to have predators. And you're going to attract them. Why, why would an otter live in the river where it struggles to catch fish if it can hop a levee, go a quarter of a mile, and eat your five-pound bass? <laughs> they will. So you need to be vigilant all the time, paying attention to that plus circling back all these things tie together going right back to that habitat concept i was talking about if you've got that and you've thought about it in the beginning where hey in year four five six and seven i want to protect my biggest fish and minimize the risk of a predator eating them how do you do it well a cormorant is it flaps its wings and uses its tail as a rudder and paddles with its feet and co go down 40 feet deep but what they can't do real easy is navigate they can't go around the stump easy. They can't get into a rock pile. They can't navigate over and under real easy. So if you created a bunch of that in the beginning where your fish can at least head there and be protected, that's the little things that all tie together. Well, hey, at 7.30, I'm going to wrap it up. I see Ed Spinopoulos checking in. <coughs> Ed, our show got interrupted today, so we've had to do it in two segments, and I don't know how to put them together. Maybe Leanne can help with that tomorrow. So, hey, thanks for tuning in, guys. We will uh, see you next Wednesday. Remember, hashtag Palm Boss. Share this to your timeline video, and you're eligible for a hat and for a mug drawing. So until next Wednesday, guys, adios. Thanks for watching.